Hi everyone, welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Johannes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting Writing for Supply Chains. For those of you who are attending the lecture live, you can ask questions at any point of time via the YouTube chat. However, during the lecture, I will not be reading the chat nor answering the questions. I will be getting back to the chat at the very end of the lecture and answer the question at this time. So, supply chains have become um, uh, very complex and very large and very international, way beyond the point where oral tradition alone is sufficient. Um, so, a better form of communication is needed, and, uh, and this is, simply put, uh, a written tradition is needed. And yet, uh, when we look at, uh, when I look at the quality of um, the written materials that are found in most supply chains, well, it turns out that um, the quality of those documents tend to be lacking, to say the least. Um, and, and so, um, this problem, while it's not, strictly speaking, you know, specific of supply chain, tend to be very harmful to supply chain precisely because of the scale and complexity that are inherently involved with um, supply chain operations. And so the intent of the lecture of today is to outline a, a series of principles um, that can uh, help your know, companies to have better practices, better uh, writing practices, with a specific intent of improving, in turn, their um, supply chain practices. And also, uh, a fair share of those principles are not, strictly speaking, again, specific of supply chain. However, um, they, are, they happen to be of prime interest to supply chain precisely uh, because supply chain is what it is and that it's something that is very complex. So indeed, first, when it comes to um, better writing, it starts with uh, better English writing. And here I'm afraid that I might not be, you know, m myself not being, you know, an, uh, a native English speaker, not being probably the most competent person to, uh, to, to carry such a lecture, but I will do my best nonetheless. And, um, and here in this area, I would like to present uh, a very short book, The Elements of Style of William Strunk, that is, uh, that is an all time classic and probably uh, a fair share part of the North American audience of those lectures is going to be already familiar with this book. And, um, and uh, being a non-native uh, non, uh, English speaker, I would actually recommend this book to, uh, to my entire audience. It is uh, a fantastic read and it's probably one of those books that have served me, I would say, the most from a professional perspective during uh, the, last, uh, the last two decades. And so, um, and in this book, uh, the author outlines um, a series of uh, very simple rules, such as, for example, omit needless words in, in sentences, omit needless phrases in paragraph, omit needless paragraph in, uh, in text. And those, those, those rules, although they are very simple, they are also very frequently overlooked. And when you overlook the, the sort of rules that are outlined in this book, you invariably end up with, uh, um, I would say, text mat uh, materials, written materials of, of very low quality. And so, um, and by the way, for a book that, uh, that, that puts a lot of emphasis on simplicity, I can't help to notice that from one edition to the next, uh, it has not gone, the book itself has not gone any simpler. And actually, the last edition that was published almost um, 50 years after the passing of the original author is, is twice as large as the original edition. So that's, that's typically one situation where I would actually recommend the very, very first edition, which I believe to be, uh, to be the best, actually. So complexity is at the core of supply chain. You know, when, when, as we define in the very first lecture of this series of lectures as um, um, supply chain being the mastery of optionality in the flows of physical goods, supply chain uh, pretty much by design intersects uh, a whole series of parties, you know, from um, clients, suppliers, sales, production, procurement, transport, all of those uh, logistics, etc., etc. All those parties, uh, a line of dialogue needs to be maintained with all of those parties at all time. I mean, uh, at all time, on, on at least I would say on a daily, weekly basis. And here we see that um, uh, all tradition tend to be quite weak uh, in this regard. And, and by the way, when I say oral tradition, from my perspective, um, email and chat 
are also part of the oral tradition, if only because with email and chat, it's basically write once, read once, and dispose. And that is very different from, I would say, a written tradition where uh, a piece of text is written with a great amount of care, uh, with the intent of having this text reread as such by many parties uh, many times over time. And so, uh, so we have we have tons of, of uh, we have a line of dialogue to, to to maintain with tons of parties. There are tons of elements that need to be routinely discussed, and um, and and we have one more problem is the evolution of the job market itself. Um, during the last two decades, the job market has, has evolved, and um, as, a, as an element of anecdotal evidence, um, the median tenure at Amazon and Google is uh, nowadays only a little more than one year. And this figure is not actually inconsistent if we, with other, uh, other parts of the job market. If we look at, uh, in France, um, uh, for uh, employees that are less than 30 years old and who have an engineering degree, um, the uh, median tenure is only one year and a half. So you see, we uh, at present time, 2021, the, the world is very different from um, the, the second part of the 20th century where people were joining a company with um, the intention of basically doing their entire career in this, uh, in this one company. Uh, people nowadays rotate in and out of their job position fairly rapidly, I mean, for, for all uh, intent and purposes and for the sort of jobs that are of interest here uh, from a supply chain perspective, we would say in, with a median duration that is um, two years of less. And so um, the problem that we have is that we have a, a line of dialogue that needs to be maintained and both the people that are inside the supply chain and people that are you know, outside the supply chain will rotate in and out of their job position uh, every, every, basically every two years. And so that, that we can further the, um, the oral tradition, and that's why having a written tradition is of prime importance. And it is of prime importance for, um, uh, in order to have an, uh, a supply chain that operates smoothly at scale and that can approve, improve upon itself. Although people will, uh, will it's most of the people who are working no, at, at any point of time in a, in a given supply chain, five years from now, will only be a, a minority because they, most of those people will have gone somewhere else in, uh, in the marketplace. And that's, that's so the, the sort of principle that we need to establish, I would say, a powerful, efficient written tradition is really um, the topic of the lecture of today. So this lecture is actually the sixth lecture of uh, a long series of, uh, of, of lecture, and this is part of the second chapter in my uh, series during the, uh, on supply chain. So during the, um, uh, the first chapter, I presented my views on supply chain, both as a field of study and as a practice. And in particular, I outlined the fact that supply chains uh, is essentially a collection of wicked problems by opposed to tame problems. So we have adversarial behaviors all over the place. And, um, and here today, we will see that essentially um, supply chain is a game played with, uh, with a team, but it's, it's a very, very large team. It can, it's a team that includes you know, hundreds and possibly thousands of teammates. And that's why um, the oral tradition is so weak when you're playing with so many people at the same time. That's why having a written you know, form of communication, especially superior forms of written communication, is so important. And that's exactly the topic of the present lecture. So first, um, it is of interest, as usual, to have a look at what science has to say on the matter. And if we want to understand what does it actually mean to have a superior form of writing, well, it is of interest to first understand uh, what does it mean uh, to actually read. And here, um, there is a very, very interesting uh, usability study, um, study that was conducted by Jakob Nielsen in uh, 2006. And uh, this usability study was based on the eye tracking you know, of, of 232 users who actually read uh, through and went through um, several thousands of, of pages. And what you can see on the screens are basically the resulting heat maps from their, from their eye movements on the page, on the web page. 
So first, um, high tracking on web pages is of prime relevance. Why? Because um, nowadays, obviously, in, in supply chain, most people are professionally reading. I mean, most of what people read professionally is being read on a computer screen. And, uh, and actually, the vast majority of what is being read on a computer screen is actually read inside a web page. And, um, and by the way, uh, emails, social networks, all of that are, might be apps, but fundamentally, they are apps that operate in a web browser. They are web apps. And so it is very much like reading on a web page. So Jakob Nielsen, through this uh, usability studies, uh, provide a key, a series of, uh, of very uh, interesting insights. Among those insights, he basically shows that although obviously the, the reading patterns are dependent on the specific page of interest, it happened that the eye movements are kind of calibrated by default according to the average page on the web. So that's, that's, that's very interesting. It means that the way people read any given page on a computer does not only depend on the page of interest that is in front of the user, but on the average other pages that people are used to read on their computer. And by the way, what Jacob Nielsen shows is that when you present a document that, is not, uh, that does not have a layout that is very much aligned with what is pretty much the average layout of the other page, uh, readers are just completely confused and they fail the most basic task at looking for information. So it's not that they stop being able to read, it's that they, they end up being overly confused by the layout. So the first finding is that um, first, the optimal layout is not something that is very much specific to the task at hand. It very much depends on what other, other I would say, companies are, are doing in terms of web layout. And the second is that Jakob Nielsen outlined uh, a very characteristic pattern of uh, uh, when people are actually reading on a computer. And I believe this pattern is of prime interest from a, a professional perspective. The, the pattern is that people essentially read from uh, with the first eye movement is a brief um, horizontal scan from left to right. Uh, followed by a brief uh, vertical scan from top to bottom, followed by the series of um, secondary horizontal scans, again from, uh, from left to right. And if you, if you draw you know, the symbol, that would be one scan, one scan, one scan, and it draws an F, uh, hence the F-shaped reading pattern. And what is very interesting here, what is at play, is that people are not so much reading as scanning. And, um, and indeed, you see, people are looking for what, uh, what Jakob Nielsen calls the informational scent. So the idea is that there is so much content to read that actually uh, a sequential reading of the documents is in practice very, very inefficient. You do not want to read you know, on a computer just like the, one, the, the way you read a book from uh, the first page to the last page in a way that is completely sequential. No, uh, people actually scan pages identify the few nuggets and then click a link and jump to the next document and repeat the process and they will only engage in an actual sequential reading once they are very convinced that um, the, the, the materials that are presented, that are being presented in front of them are really relevant for the task at hand. Indeed, uh, people are not you know, only reading just because it's enjoyable. Uh, they have, uh, they, there is a purpose, there is typically a task involved. And that is of prime relevance from a professional perspective as we are, um, uh, as we are concerned here um, when it comes to um, supply chain elements. And so uh, when we look at these F-shaped patterns, we see that if the, the words, are, the very important words are not present in the very title and at the very beginning of every paragraph, top paragraph, we can infer based on this eye tracking study that p users will be blind and will actually miss the information. And this ha is happening in practice. Jakob Nielsen in, in his study shows that websites that present written material that do not you know, abide to this rule to have the very the elements that are of prime relevance being part of the title and part of the very first few words of the paragraph are extensively confusing users who in turn fail at accomplishing even very basic tasks on the, the website of interest. 
So this is something that is very important and I believe very, very relevant for all the written materials that we want to produce for, to support uh, a written tradition for supply chain. Now, as it frequently turned out, um, science arrived about one century after the practice. And so it happens that there is a, a practice called the inverted pyramid that uh, became gradually popular and dominant in the news at the turn of the 20th century. So that's, that's, that's more than a century ago. And it turned out that the inverted pyramid, which is a writing form, the inverted pyramid is literally the embodiment of the F-shaped uh, reading pattern. So the inverted pyramid is literally how you should write if you assume that people are going to, re to, to read with this, um, with this sort of, of scanning uh, that follows an F-shaped pattern. And um, the inverted pyramid, by the way, uh, goes uh, under various names in the various industries. So it, it became gradually the dom dominant form of, of writing the news uh, by the turn of the 20th century. However, um, when my parents joined uh, Procter & Gamble in, in the 70s, um, it was already a very established technique that was actually taught at Procter & Gamble you know, 50 years ago. So uh, I believe that by the second half of, um, by the time of the second half of the 20th uh, century, it was already a very established and very mature practice in many large companies and more precisely companies that were having fairly sizable um, supply chains to operate in the first place. And I do not think that it was uh, completely a coincidence. And so uh, the inverted pyramids follows essentially two principles. The first one is simply that the most important element must come first. And literally, this is, you know, in this, uh, in this headline of the New York Times, the first four words are men walk on moon. And those are, um, you know, if we just read the first four words and nothing more, we already have uh, the essence of what uh, this page is going to discuss. And this is very, very powerful with just four words. So that's, so the idea is that you really want to put what matters the most at the very, very top. And the idea is that as you progress through the text, you will go through things that are of lesser and lesser importance. But really the idea is that first what is top importance, then what is almost top importance, and that is almost, almost top importance, and you go for the gradient from most important to less important. So this is, this is the, I would say, the, the, first, uh, the first cardinal rule of this, uh, of, this, um, uh, of this inverted pyramid style. And by the way, that means that, for example, a very imp if, if what is very, very important is the conclusion, then the conclusion can be the very, very beginning. It's not going to be at the end of the document. It's going to be at the very start of the, begin of the document. And I believe that this pattern, this first rule, goes very much against uh, most of what is actually taught in many schools and universities when it comes to writing. And then the second rule is the idea is that, um, so you start with, first rule is you start with what is most important. The second rule is um, you want the text to be self-sufficient whenever, uh, whenever you, the reader stop reading. So the idea is that if you just read the first, um, uh, the title, the title is self-sufficient. If you read the, the title and the first paragraph, it is self-sufficient. If you read the title, the first paragraph, the first page, it is self-sufficient. So the idea is that um, you write the document in a, in a way that the reader can decide themselves when they want to stop reading. Knowing that you start with the most element, you do not control uh, how much interest the reader has in your document. So you want to make really sure that you give the opportunity for the reader to stop reading when they want, when they want, and, uh, and the, the bulk of the most important part, part of the message will have to be treated. So the reader knows that there is nothing that is more important that he hasn't read or she hasn't read already when um, this reader stops reading the document. And again, this, is, um, this follows very much the idea of a professional use of the documentation where people are not going to have just one document to read, but they will have an ocean of, of documents, of memos, of notes, and they will basically jump from one document to another, seeking, um, following the informational sense, considering you know, what, uh, for the task at hand. And that's, that is very much you know, the, the, the idea that is embodied in this um, inverted pyramid writing form. And again, this goes very much against 
um, the sort of, 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 of writing style that are taught at schools and, uh, and universities, for example, the essay with an introduction, a development, a conclusion, is, I believe, a form uh, of, of writing that is deeply inappropriate for professional communication. It's, it's literally, <laughs> if you want to drive your hierarchy nuts, start writing essays you know, with in, in intro, development, conclusion. This is um, desperately inefficient for people who really want to get to the bottom of, uh, 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 of the thing and just move on. So um, writing for, for supply chain. So here in this lecture, I will, I will present um, a series uh, of, um, of elements, uh, how you can actually transition your uh, your supply chain from essentially an oral tradition to a written tradition. And I will provide you know, a series of guidelines that concerns the various situations and elements you know, encountered in a supply chain. And then in a second time, I will be reviewing a series of, of, of um, unfortunate bad practices that happen to be unfortunately very popular. So, the first thing that we need to, um, to, to put, uh, I would say, in writing in a supply chain is, um, is the problem, the problem itself. And here, I would say that, again, there is a mindset that is uh, extensively taught in universities uh, and schools is that the problem is a given. You know, when, when you're a student, the professor gives you a problem, and uh, as a student, you're supposed to give the answer. And, and, and you will get good grades if you have the correct answer uh, and obviously the problem itself being, you know, given by the professor, the, the problem has to be correct in a way, although you don't even question the validity of the problem itself. Uh, you, you think that the, the whole thing is, lies in the correctness of, um, of the answer to the problem. But um, from a real world perspective, this is complete nonsense. Um, usually what the most difficult part of putting anything in business, in writing, is to decide what constitutes actually a problem. This is, the problem is not a given. This is, um, this is something very subtle, very nuanced, and usually it takes a great deal of effort to even you know, um, conceptualize what sort of problem is being, uh, are we even trying to address. And I believe that for, for most supply chains, um, the, the starting point of having a written tradition is first to put in writing what the supply chain is about and, and focusing on, on, on the why, you know, the, the Toyota style, the why, why, why recursive. Um, you, you do forecasting, why are you doing forecasting? Forecasting to support planning, okay. Uh, why do you do planning? Uh, we need planning because we need to anticipate things and, and, and pass orders with um, a long time in advance. Why do you do that? Why, 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 etc. So it's, it's literally documenting the problem, start by asking all the whys and going down the rabbit hole to see exactly why are we even uh, doing that and to challenge all the preconception. And here, it is very tempting, you know, to, um, to, to, to circumvent entirely the, the problem of, of putting uh, the problem itself in writing because it's actually very tough, you know, and um, it's, it's, it's very difficult and you're most likely going to antagonize many people doing so. You see, that the thing is that um, defining a problem is, is not going to please everybody. Remember that supply chain is at the intersection of a, a lot of people and uh, a lot of parties. And, and when you start touching the very definition of the problem, it has a, a political element to it. I mean, political and defines the very structure of the company you're operating it. And by the way, um, there is also, but, but it has, it has uh, I would say, a silver lining to it. Um, although it is very difficult, it is typically politically sensitive, is that when you start putting um, your supply chain problems in writing, um, what you do not understand about your company and uh, what you do not understand about all the other parties, you know, involved, uh, procurement, production, marketing, sales, etc., will become much more apparent to everybody. So, and that's a good thing because it means that if you start putting all those elements in writing, well, um, the sort of things that you're already doing wrong because you, you can't even properly uh, think the problem in the first place and that, that becomes apparent when you start to write about the problem, uh, will become apparent and then other people will have the opportunity to challenge you on that and um, for, I would say, the greater interest of the company. Then the second thing is, is the data. And um, I, I think it's a very re reasonable proposition to say that most 
um, you know, modern um, optimization techniques for supply chain, you know, predictive optimization in particular, but not limited to, um, are extensively dependent on data. And as we have seen in, in the previous lecture, um, data in, um, in a supply chain doesn't fall from the sky. You know, it is not, there is no such thing as a data set that could be ready-made for data science. The data that exists comes from uh, pieces of enterprise software that have not been engineered with um, the idea of doing data science. Those, it's not the ERP, which should, uh, should be named, you know, ERM, Enterprise Resource Management, has not been designed to do data science. It has been designed to operate the company more efficiently with higher, a higher degree of productivity, with a higher degree of reliability. And, uh, and so the sort of data that you get is, it, it's not that the data is bad, it very frequently is that the data is just what it is and it is actually badly documented. And so um, the, the, probably the second stage of establishing a written tradition for your supply chain start by actually um, documenting in the writing all the data. And here, the idea is that uh, the, the thing that is the most, uh, the biggest challenge is frequently to establish the semantic of the data and what sort of purpose does it serve from a supply chain perspective. And so remember that we are talking of, of, um, of enterprise systems that may contain hundreds of tables. And in every table, we may have dozens and potentially hundreds of fields. And every single field in every single table, a field is basically a column in a, in a relational system, every single field needs to be documented. And it's a semantic that you will establish. And when we think, when we are looking at, for example, the semantic of an order date, what does act an order date actually mean? You see, uh, the, it is very, very ambiguous. For example, an order date can be the date when the order was created in the system. It can be the date um, where um, the entry was last modified by a user. It might be the uh, date at which the order was actually approved by uh, someone in the company. It might be the date at which the payment was made. It might be the date at which the supplier acknowledged receiving the order, et cetera, et cetera. There might be like 20 different interpretations. So whenever you see, you see a, a field such as you know, order date or anything in, uh, in, a, um, in an, a piece of enterprise software, this field is very deeply ambiguous. And again, the semantic lies in what people are doing with this, um, with this uh, column, not what is actually documented by the software vendor. And by the way, if we uh, go back to uh, one of the previous lectures that I had in this series of, of, of supply chain lectures, uh, the one about um, uh, experimental optimization, we see that the semantic is essentially a theory is that you have about the, the nature of the data. It's a theory. It is, um, and thus, the only way to know whether your theory is actually correct is to put it to the test of the experiment. And so one of the fallacy when it comes to uh, the documentation of uh, the supply chain data is to think that this can be done in isolation with regard to, um, uh, uh, to um, the decision-making process of the supply chain. This is not the case. The, it's only by actually building a set of numerical recipes that generate supply chain decision that you can put your theories, which are the semantic that you believe to be true for your data, to the test. Until you've done that, well, what you have is unproven theories about, uh, about your data. Then um, the next thing that needs to be documented is um, the product. So remember, in the, again, in one of the previous lecture, the one that was titled Product-Oriented Delivery for Supply Chain, and by product, I mean software product. And we have seen that essentially um, the practice of supply chain, or actually, actually the modern practice of supply chain, um, uh, is to build a set of numerical recipes that will generate automatically all the mundane decisions that your supply chain needs to operate on a daily basis. Uh, again, supply chain, I define supply chain as the mastery of optionality. And the supply chain product is essentially the piece of software that is going to you know, leverage all the options to take every single day, all the right decisions that need to be taken. 
knowing that most of um, the supply chain decisions are extensively um, repetitive, like what do you need to, uh, to, to, to replenish in terms of stock? What do you need to produce? Uh, what sort of inventory movement do you need to produce? For every single price that you manage, should you steer this price up or down, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the product is essentially the piece of software that collect all the numerical recipes that generate all those, uh, all those decisions. And this product needs to be documented. However, uh, in a written form, obviously. And, and um, the, the big problem here is that there is a big temptation of essentially paraphrasing the code. Um, you see, so you have like, um, obviously the software is implemented with a programming language. And, uh, and there is a, a temptation, which is uh, which it, it's something it's very tempting because it's actually very easy to do, is when you're documenting software, it's just to paraphrase the code. However, paraphrasing the code is completely useless. If you want to know what the code is doing, well, you can just read the code. You see, it's not because you kind of translate the code in English in ways that are much more ambiguous and much more, uh, uh, that are actually harder to comprehend, that you're actually making the life of anybody easier. So the purpose when, when we are documenting you know, a software product, the, 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 this is not about paraphrasing the code. This is about um, explaining the why. Why do you, you know, there is, uh, there is this saying in computer science is that the only code that has, uh, that has no bug is the absence of code. So whenever you have you know, a block of, um, of, of software logic written in code, the question is, why do we have this logic in the first place? You know, can't we do just without it? Can't we just remove that from um, uh, the product? Would the product you know, work just, just uh, as fine without that? And so we really need to answer the why. Why uh, did we implement those numerical recipes in the first place? And what are the sort of hidden problems that we have to face? Because you see, the problem is that if you do not document the why, uh, people may be inclined in changing the, the numerical recipes uh, in ways that are not going to work because they don't understand why it was made this way in the first place. Maybe there is you know, a, a twist in terms of, of, of numerical formulas where you think, well, this formula is kind of weird. I could, I, 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 there is a, a much easier form to write what appears to be pretty much the same thing. But maybe the easier form has a problem of numerical stability. So maybe you see the reason why you have a, a, a bit of logic that looks a bit counterintuitive is because actually this specific logic, this specific form of logic is numerically stable, except that you can't really understand the why that went into the writing of this code unless it is documented. So it's very important to document the why. It is also very important to document all the sort of failed attempts, because again, um, softwares are, uh, uh, software products are developed typically in ways that are highly iterative. You try stuff, most of the attempts fail for diverse reasons, and you move on. And what you see is just the result of a long evolutionary path where uh, many dead branches have been cut over time. And, and the thing is that if you do not document all the, the branches that were cut over time, well, what happens is that you're going to repeat um, the same sort of, of, of mistakes over and over and over. And again, remember that uh, we live in a world where the median you know, turnover, uh, the median tenure of, uh, of people in companies, especially people who have an engineering degree, is going to be something like two years. So you cannot expect that people will still be here you know, 10 years from now to remember all the sort of things that was tried and that turned out to be very, very bad ideas. It's very important to document the why you did um, choose this option for your numerical recipes and why other seemingly good options were actually dismissed because they were failing in ways that may be very, very counterintuitive. And by the way, as a final word, it is also important to document, by the way, the, the weakness, the known weaknesses in the numerical recipes because it's, uh, it's probably the, the thing that are of, of prime interest for the continued you know, improvement of the software product driving the supply chain. Now, we also have um, the process to document. And by the way, the process is what people are, I define the process as what people are expected to do on a, routine basis. And, and, and here you see that due to the way I am approaching supply chain, um, the process should be approached with great care. 
You see, because in the ideal world, in the ideal world, there is no process whatsoever because people, uh, everything that repeats itself, well, if, if there is something that is repetitive to be done, well, it should be implemented in the software and thus it will be automated away. So essentially, the process of the things that cannot be automated away or um, that resist automation one way or another. And, and here, I believe that, so nonetheless, you know, we, we live uh, and supply chains operate in less than ideal world conditions. You know, that's what a, a real, world, uh, uh, real world perspective actually implies. And so, so, so yes, there is always, even if we try to have a very, very high degree of automation, there is always a degree of, of, you know, of, of, of process driven by humans um, that, are, that are still involved. And, um, and the problem that I have with, uh, with process is that I believe that the sort of mindset that is going in, for example, in the ISO 9000 you know, perspective is, is very, very toxic. If we look at the sort of, um, of, of mindset that is emphasized by the, um, of the you know, ISO 9000 series, it's, um, it's very much the documentation of the what. So documenting the process is really about detailing what the process is about. Um, Docum documenting the what is very important if you're, if you're dealing, let's say, with chemicals, you know, something where the process uh, should be followed to the letter for uh, obvious, you know, safety and industrial reasons. Um, that is true. However, I think that the process, as, as far as supply chain is concerned, is essentially associated with the sort of things that cannot be automated away. So they are those sort of things tend to be elusive, they tend to vary, they tend to be uh, nuanced and subtle. It's not like, you know, a, a, a chemical process. And so, um, and so the, the problem of this, you know, ISO 9000 series, you know, are, are of standards is that they put way too much focus on the what. And, um, and this turns to be, I would say, toxic in the sense that very quickly, um, the process is established itself and, and people start having questioning the process but only uh, question the adherence to the process. That's the problem is when you document the what is that very quickly, you know, people start thinking about whether you're doing a good job with this process but whether, um, the, whether you are absolutely compliant with regard to the, good to the, to, uh, to the process itself and doing a good job becomes how compliant are you with regard to the process? And as a, as a tidbit of anecdotal evidence, one of the banks used by LOCAD, um, it's a very large, very international bank, established in many, many countries, uh, having tons of, doing tons of advertising in, in airports. Well, <laughs> it turned out that as part of their process, they kept using fax machines uh, pretty much uh, for two decades past the point where basically the entire world has moved on. And, and I, I, during those last two decades, uh, and they were still until very recently abundantly using fax machines. And, uh, and when I was asking, I was saying, well, we have to be compliant with our process. And you see, that's the problem with, with the process is that when you establish a process, the process tend to, uh, as a, always kind of a, a bureaucratic core to it, and it tend to outlast its use, usefulness. So when I say documenting a process, I, I, I say you need to really pay a lot of attention to the why and to understand what were the, the key reason that drives you into uh, the establishment is of this process in the first place. And it's very important to remember the why because when, um, when the why for the process evaporates, and that can happen you know, when technology evolves, there are all sorts of problems that just do not happen anymore, all sorts of needs that don't present themselves in the same form anymore, when basically the initial condition that triggered the emergence of the process in the first place, when those conditions are gone, then the process should cease. And that's, that should be really the, what goes um, for first and foremost into the documentation of the, uh, of the process is the why, to make really sure that this process is extinguished uh, when it ceases to be relevant. Again, um, it's a matter of, of efficiency and uh, supply chains being large and complex and to a, a large extent, you know, um, that is quite unavoidable, bureaucratic. We need to pay a lot of attention to those elements. And so to sum it up, um, when we think of, of moving 
um, a, a supply chain from uh, an oral tradition to a written tradition. And the compilation of all those materials should be put together in what is typically referred to as LOCAD as the manual, you know, the, the big book of the supply chain. And this big book is going to be the consolidation of the problem, the data, the product, the process. And um, it may, and it, it happens to be, you know, at, at LOCAD, when we are looking at, at, uh, at large clients who operate, you know, um, large supply chains, this manual may be, um, uh, may, may be several hundred pages long. So it is, I mean, again, supply chains are very complex. There is tons of things that needs to be documented, you know, tons of, uh, tons of uh, ver uh, vertical uh, industry-specific changes. So the, the problem definition itself is very complex. Um, then the data can be very complex. You can have one ERP. You can have, you know, worst case, you have dozens of ERPs in a, in a large companies, one per country. Um, so there might be, you know, tons of data to document. There might be the, the numerical recipe uh, itself can be extensively complex just out of necessity. The, 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 the product that drives the supply chain decision should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. So even, you know, as simple as possible, it can be something that is very, very complex, just reflecting the complexity of supply chain itself. And then the processes, again, we are talking of having potentially dozens of parties involved, so the processes can be quite extensive, and so we can end up with a, a massive manual. And that's why it is very important for this manual to stick to the inverted pyramid writing form. You know, the inverted pyramid apply at any scale, so the, 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 the introduction of the manual should be uh, uh, written in inverted pyramid style where you present the most important elements about the manual right in the introduction. And then every single chapter should be written itself following the inverted pyramid. So every chapter should start with the most important element first and then, you know, go down to the, to, to, toward things gradually to our things that are less and less relevant, less and less important, I would say. And then you would apply this principle of inverted pyramid to the section in the chapters themselves. So you see, uh, the inverted pyramid form is something that is intended to help people navigate, you know, efficiently um, uh, fairly sizable documents. The idea is that maybe the manual would be read sequentially when there is, uh, you know, a, a, a new employee that joined in. This person is going to spend initially a few days to go through uh, from start to end the, the, the entire supply chain manual. However, most of the time people would just, you know, jump in, jump out of the manual to just, you know, drill down to zoom directly for the information that is most relevant, find it, and then, and then uh, go on with the task at hand. Uh, and that's why the inverted pyramid um, is so important as a writing form when you want to consolidate a large amount of, 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 of written materials in a way that is highly productive to leverage in your daily operations. It's not, again, it's not something that is intended to be read linearly, uh, except maybe at the very beginning when you actually join the company. By the way, at LOCAD, um, it is part of our established practice when we, when we carry, um, um, I would say, a supply chain uh, initiative for a client to compile all of that. The document is actually referred to as a joint procedure manual. Uh, the reason of the joint procedure prefix is because LOCAD is a company that is outside, you know, uh, the company of interest. So it's a joint procedure manual in the sense that it's a manual that is shared about the supply chain that is shared with a third party company that happens to be LOCAD. And one of um, the prime interest and prime value of having such a manual is when you need to transition from one supply chain scientist to the next. So in, in, the, in, in, in the very uh, second lecture of the first chapter, the one where I presented the vision for the quantitative supply chain, I presented the role of the supply chain scientist, uh, the person who has to take ownership on the generation and on the numerical recipes that generate the supply chain decisions. And obviously, uh, LOCAD, like, like, uh, like most other companies, you know, we are not immune to turnover. And so it is very important, the manual is an insurance that uh, ensure, I would say, a smooth transition from one supply chain scientist to the next, because it's literally the, the, the manual is the embodiment of all the business thinking that went into um, the establishment of, of the product and of the processes that are associated uh, and layered on top of the product. So, um, when it comes to written materials, there is plenty of leeway to do plenty of wrong, and it is 
fairly easy to produce uh, written materials of an exceedingly low quality. And there are a certain list of, I would say, of, of anti-patterns that I would like to point out. So, by the way, we briefly touched uh, the notion of anti-patterns in one of uh, my previous lectures about negative knowledge about supply chain. It's negative knowledge represents the sort of things where you know that there is kind of a, a something that is widely perceived as a solution, a practice, yet in practice, uh, it, this, this solution turns out to be harmful you know, to the company that engage in this practice. And that's what anti-patterns are about. It's, it's sort of things that are done by a, a lot of people, but it's actually, um, it's, it's, um, it is actually harmful for the company and it needs to be avoided. So let's review the sort of, of um, bad practices of anti-pattern that are most harmful to supply chain in my experience. The first one is happy talk. Um, so happy talk is characterized by a form of corporate speech that is, entirely, that is almost entirely devoid of information. So you have you know, uh, a piece of corporate writing that is almost pure noise and no information whatsoever. And uh, I believe that it's, it's the natural consequence of seeking consensus. You see, when people, uh, we are social beings, um, humans, and we don't try to antagonize the people we work with. That's, that's very natural to, to, to want to play it nice with all the other people that, that are surrounding you. And so by default, people, uh, unless you're a complete psychopath, most people would seek something like a consensus. And the problem, the specific problem of supply chain is that supply chain is at the intersection of so many parties, you know, production, sales, marketing, procurement, uh, purchasing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you are at the intersection of so many parties that if you seek complete consensus across all those parties, you end up with uh, the, the smallest common denominator that happen to be almost virtually nothing. Um, so that's, that's the big problem. And here, so it's very, very tempting to, um, to, to basically then um, say nothing because whatever you say is going to antagonize somebody somewhere. And so when people start to realize that, um, then um, the happy talk take, I would say, another form that is even worse than just saying nothing is that people realize that if they say anything, it will, you know, uh, it, it will go badly for them or they will antagonize people that they don't want to do. And so the next stage consists of actually um, saying what you can say without antagonizing anybody, which is just to say positive things about you, you yourself, and your team. And then it becomes a sort of virtue signaling exercise where essentially corporate communication becomes pieces of advertising that just promotes whoever is actually writing the copy. So obviously all of that is completely not aligned with the corporate interest of actually improving and doing anything good for the supply chain itself. So um, as, a, as a litmus test, I would say, um, to detect happy talk is whenever you see a piece of corporate writing, just ask yourself the, sim the simple question, could I take this piece of text put it in another division or even another company, and would this piece of text be equally relevant in this other division or in this other company? If you can find a piece of text that is, that when you see that basically you could move this text to, um, to another division or another company and it would be equally relevant, well, the odds are super, super high that it's like pure happy talk and that it's actually relevant to another company just due to the fact that it doesn't say anything. So because it doesn't say anything, it's kind of relevant to every single company on Earth. So the solution is essentially uh, a, a courage. I mean, you, you need to stand for something. You know, there is this saying that if you don't stand for, uh, for something, you will fall for anything. Uh, but, but fundamentally, um, you can't please, supply chain can't please everybody. It, supply chain is essentially an art of trade-off, you know. If, uh, if you um, please to the utmost sales by having completely sky-high service levels, 
So yes, you have an excellent quality of service, but uh, you will not please finance because you generate so much waste and so much dead inventory in the process. If you want to please uh, to the extreme you know, production and that uh, it's whatever production says, then it may be things that are not exactly aligned with what get traction on the market. So it's not going to fit what people are selling and what the marketing is pushing. So you see, supply chain is essentially a trade-off between all those parties, so you can't please uh, uh, everyone. And so you, you, you have to basically establish the fact that it's a balance. And so, um, and so yes, to some degree, you will antagonize all the parties involved, although the, the point is not to antagonize those parties, it's to just to reach a trade-off that, that is as much profitable as possible for the company. So then, Arcane, um, so arcane naming, arcane knowledge is a time-tested, uh, I would say, practice to hold uh, a bureaucratic power in an organization. This is, uh, this is very ancient. I think it's probably a technique that is uh, thousands of years old. Um, and, and by the way, supply chain being what it is, uh, you know, the mastery of optionality is, fundamenta is fundamentally, you know, a, 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 a practice that is established at the management level. You know, I really differentiate supply chain and logistics. And I really define supply chain as a mastery of optionality. So it is essentially a management layer. And thus, at its core, there is a bureaucratic element that is unavoidable. You see, it's, it's a bit the glue that holds the company together. It cannot be avoided. But it is very important to recognize that at the core of the supply chain, we have a, 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 a core of, of bureaucracy. And so it is uh, very tempting and very easy to get to the slope of arcane naming. And, um, and you don't need a grand plan for that. You just have to be lazy. And, 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 and actually, it will only reinforce the elements of arcane, uh, of arcane naming. Why? Because if you're kind of lazy when it comes to naming, then you will end up with, um, with names that are badly chosen and that are pretty much opaque. And, uh, and interestingly, this opacity, although it is not the prime intent, it is just the result of, of, I would say, of a certain degree of carelessness in these regards, will be granting an extra you know, layer of power to um, these elements of organization. And by the way, as a, a litmus test, you can check whether your organization, how many acronyms are actually used in your organization. Um, um, from my perspective is that uh, the, the propensity of using acronyms goes, you know, hand in hand with the amount of, uh, of I would say, uh, uh, arcane power, you know, wielded inside the company by bureaucratic parties. You know, companies that try to stay away from uh, bureaucratic power try to minimize those sort of super opaque acronyms that are only reserved for uh, the initiated, in a way. So. Um, so, the, and those names, I mean, they are, they are not just a problem, um, those, you know, those arcane names are not just a problem just due to uh, political issues, you know. It is literally, an, um, it is uh, an ongoing amount of opacity where you're losing, you know, efficiency. You know, it's going to degrade every, the productivity of, of all the things that you try to do in the company are, is going to be degraded due to this ongoing friction, whenever somebody is going to tackle any problem of any kind, the, uh, this employee is going to face you know, half a dozen of acronyms. And even if you have you know, a, a very nicely organized manual, this person will be always going back to the glossary section of the manual to figure out what those acronyms are actually meaning. And it's all going to be very confusing and a degree of. So there is a, a real element of, of actual operational efficiency. And even more importantly, I believe that, um, as I, I pointed out you know, in this first series of guidelines, positive guidelines about establishing a written tradition, the most difficult question that needs to be answered is the why. Uh, and it is already so difficult to answer in, in written form um, a why question as opposed to a what question, um, that any degree of confusion, for example, by having improper names, is really making the question even more, even harder to answer. So uh, having proper names is really uh, absolutely essential in order to make sure that it is uh, to reduce the amount of ambient confusion in a, in a space that is the one of the supply chain that is very, very complex already by design.
So the solution is, uh, is essentially good names. And there is no mystery. It's a lot of work. And there is a saying in computer science that there is only um, two exceedingly difficult problems in computer science. The first one is cash invalidation. Um, and the second one is variable naming. So that, you know, that connects to that. It's uh, finding good names is very, very difficult. It takes efforts. And, 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 and those things, it's not unreasonable to spend one full hour to actually find a good name for something. You know, this is not a waste of time. This is, this is very important. So, health bullets. Um, this is another sort of, of problem. And here, um, the, the thing is, slides, you know, as found in, in PowerPoints, very rarely, rarely, very rarely have the qualities that you would expect from a piece of text. And, um, and by the way, this is not a problem of format. This is not a problem of having the text presented in a landscape mode rather than being po presented in, uh, in portrait mode. This has nothing to do. The, the, the crux of the problem is what I would refer to as a sort of graphic writing that is typically characterized by a, a heavy usage of, of bullet points. And, and you see, those bullet points, they have one consequence, is that they, 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 are, they, have, um, they are used for one reason, I believe. It's because they replace all the logical connectors in the text, you know, the, in, the, in the grammatical sense. The logical connectors that would say and, or or, or then, or yet, or however, or furthermore, you know, all those logical connectors that would, you know, um, uh, uh, firmly ground the semantic of what is being said in, uh, in the slide, well, you just replace all of those logical connectors by bullet points, and what you end up with is a text that is um, deeply ambiguous. And, by the way, for whoever is actually writing the text on a slide, it is typically um, not necessarily the prime intent, but one of the reasons why th this person is actually doing it this way. It's because uh, uh, writing a piece of text that is massively ambiguous through bullet points is uh, probably orders of magnitude easier compared to writing an actual text with logical connectors where you have to write something that makes sense. Uh, and so as, uh, as, a, as a litmus test, I believe that there is a very, very simple litmus test where you can decide where what you're reading is actually, you know, um, uh, some sort of, of, of uh, hell's bullet or, or graphic writing is can you read what has been written aloud? You know, you, you just take the text and you try to read it aloud. Does it make sense? If when you attempt to read what is written aloud, it doesn't make sense, then this is not proper writing, as simple as that. You should be able, when there is a piece of text that is written, you should be able to write it, to, to read it aloud, and it should make sense. And by the way, um, there are other forms and variants of graphic, you know, of graphic writing, those two by two uh, uh, diagrams, you know, such as uh, the sort of, of SWOT, you know, strength, weaknesses, opportunity, threat, diagrams, all this sort of, of nonsense is typically just like bullet points. It's the sort of things that are very easy to produce, uh, that are super deeply ambiguous, and that, are, that convey very, very little information. So the solution here is very simple. You need to just write phrases, uh, as simple as that. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, there are very successful companies, like, for example, Amazon, who have, uh, I would say, a massive distrust of, um, of slides, of the slide format. And for example, one of the practices that, uh, that has been established for, for probably more than two decades at Amazon is the idea of the memo. So whenever there is a meeting to be started with, with many people involved, uh, many being like four or more, uh, a memo will be written prior to the meeting. It should be just plain text, you know, no, nothing fancy, maybe an illustration if you have like a graph, but this is it. It should be just a plain text memo, and the meeting will start with something like 10 minutes of silent reading. So all the parties involved will actually join the meeting, start by reading the memo, and then the rest of the meeting will just be discussing what is actually written. And I believe this, um, this sort of, of, of technique to be um, to be very, very efficient. And that's, by the way, a technique that I've been using with um, the key management of LOCAD for a very, very long time. I believe it is very efficient. Um, 
Another, and, and that would be my, my final anti-pattern, is, um, is droning. Um, so droning is when basically people uh, in a company operate as corporate drones uh, and, and they pretend to be corporate drones instead of, 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 of actually being humans. And um, I believe that is something that emerged very naturally from a, a very misguided intent of, of wanting to play the act of being part of a large corporation. You see, um, a lot of people take uh, being part of a corporation way too seriously. And, and I mean by that, that if you take yourself too seriously, well, you end up with um, communications that looks like as if it was written by robots to be read by robots. And let's be honest, um, you know, supply chains can be boring at times. You know, not all those things are, are exceedingly interesting. Uh, a lot of stuff when it comes to documenting, you know, hundreds of fields in, uh, into a, from, that originate from a piece of enterprise software, this is not exactly something that is particularly, you know, interesting or exhilarating. So it can, so the job itself can be very mundane and can be very boring. And that's fine, you know, that's fine. But if you double down on the boring aspect, you know, by, by having a piece of text that is written as if you were like a complete drone, then you end up with something that is so incredibly tedious that the mind of the reader switch off. And you see, this is a problem is that, can, can you consider that a piece of text is correctly written if whenever somebody um, attempts to read the document fell asleep, intellectually speaking, halfway through the text because it's so incredibly tedious. So the idea is that obviously this is, you know, those are corporate materials. It's not, we are not going to crack jokes. Uh, but you know, it is authorized to have stupid robots as I do on this slide, you know, in your documentation. It's okay, it's not a corporate crime to have a tidbit of humor. You have the right um, to, to present the elements in a ways that are going to pique the interest of your readers. And if you do that, well, it, it, it will actually make the text better. Better in the sense that it will be more efficient to convey whatever message you are trying to convey through those written materials. And this is particularly important in supply chain because those materials can be quite extensive. And, and then you see usually the, the default status is that, oh, why did you, didn't you read the documentation? Well, I could not be bothered. You know, it was just too absolutely tedious. So the solution is basically just to act as humans and to write for humans um, the document in your supply chain. So my conclusion uh, for this lecture is whenever you know you need to transition your supply chain from essentially an oral tradition to a written tradition. This is, um, this is really a matter of efficiency at scale and there is an enormous amount of, of productivity and benefits that can be reaped just by doing this transition. And the, the, the one frequent objection that I get when I present that is that people object, but it's so incredibly difficult to write text. I would say, yes, it is actually very difficult, but um, it's just because text um, makes all the challenges bubble up. You know, it's, it's just that all the difficulties are surfacing uh, you see, slides, and especially slides with bullet points, are so much easier to produce just because you are kind of um, circumventing the difficulty in the first place instead of, of, of taking the problem head on. So, so text is very good because it forces you to confront the text. And, and yes, maybe it will take an entire day to write half a page, half writing in one day half a page about you know, a problem statement for your, um, for your supply chain. Yes, if it's what it takes to have actually a very, very good and solid, very established, you know, uh, half a page that really firmly establishes the sort of, of, of foundations of what is it that you're actually trying to solve for your supply chain, so be it. Um, this is what it takes. But fundamentally, I would say, better text. For most of the situation, text is a superior alternative. And when I say text, I mean text from... Uh, um, a, 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 a written tradition where it's going to be something written with care and written with the intent of having this piece of text maintained over time and reread a great number of times. And by the way, uh, many companies praise themselves of having people thinking out of the box, but in most companies, or maybe not most, but many companies, 
people are not even capable of even describing the, the box in the first place, and certainly not to describe that in writing. So the first stage is that if you want to think out outside the box, is to be able to describe the box in writing in the first place, and that would be uh, the, the starting point. Okay, um, excellent. So, that's, uh, so now that I will actually jump to the questions, uh, the next lecture will, ha will take place um, uh, two weeks from now. It will be another persona. So remember, personas are essentially uh, extensive descriptions of the problems, the problems alone. We don't want to jump to the solution. And it will be an aerospace persona. We are, we are going to explore the very, very specific world of the aerospace supply chain that are very unlike you know, most other supply chains. So let's have a look at the questions. So, uh, so a first question from Matthew. How could, if at all, semantics apply to a data lake? Is it truly a data lake if fields are uh, defined? So for me, a data lake, there are, there, are, there are several ingredients that goes into uh, a data lake, and, and some of them are just of pure technological nature. The first thing is that enterprise software operates on relational databases. I mean, 99% of the enterprise, the pieces of enterprise software out there operates on, you know, uh, 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 just traditional relational databases like a SQL Server for Microsoft, Oracle, or, 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 or Postgres, or MySQL, these sort of things. And, um, and those, those systems are essentially designed for a balanced amount of read and writes. As simple as that. So you have a database system that is designed so that the amount of, of reads and writes are supposed to be balanced, and it's supposed to be, and those systems are tuned for very small writes and very small reads. So basically, you're just modifying one stock position, and then you're reading one stock uh, position at a time. And that's what those systems are for. However, when it comes to data crunching, you have a problem, and that's a very mundane problem, and that's exactly the, what the problem that data lakes try to solve. The problem that you're facing is that when you want to crunch the data, you want to read all the data at once in batch. And then those relational systems are very badly designed. They are absolutely not designed to dump efficiently all the data that they contain, especially if they want to be able to dump all the data that they contain to many parties at the same time. So I believe that the data lake is fundamentally a layers, an, a technological layer, where you're just going to create a copy, just a copy, no transformation whatsoever, of all the data that lies in all the various systems in one place. And to maintain a synchronization, and the key added value of the data lake is to ensure that um, agents, it, it doesn't have to be a human, you know, agents that want to just to read all the data in bulk can do that without interfering with um, the production. And by the way, the data lakes will present one value is that when you start reading the data in bulk, you don't crash literally the production because the system is overloaded. That's, you know, key value number one. The second value is that um, the, uh, the applicative landscape of your company might be a very heterogeneous. So you might have tons of, of, of different systems. You, know, you might have a, an Oracle database, a, a Sybase database, a Microsoft database, a Postgres uh, database, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that are many, many systems with different interfaces, different you know, uh, software components to access the databases. The data lake provides you know, a unified uh, way to simply query all of those data. So that's the key value. However, when it comes to, um, I think, a good data lake, uh, when it comes to the semantic, well, beware, the semantic, as I said, in experimental optimization, the semantic that you have for a field of data is very much depends on what you're trying to do with the data. So there is this kind of illusion, and again, that can be, uh, there is a bureaucratic element to it, which is to have uh, an extensive data lake team um, that tries to document everything, although they are lacking the key mechanism, which is experimental optimization, to challenge whether the semantic that they are, you know, the sort that they are um, writing down for every single field is actually correct. So my suggestion, when you have a data lake, is to keep this team super, super lean and super reduced, and just uh, and the the, the 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 team that operates the data lake has only one task, and one task only is to provide. Uh, uh, um, a synchronized view of the production data 
in the data lake in ways that is technically unified, but not necessarily to take care of the documentation. Documentation will be produced by, by the teams that are you know, doing something with the data. So a second question from uh, Samir Sassi. Sometimes simple diagrams designed with automated solution like Microsoft Vision could make our life easier and remove a huge part of data discovery workload. Do you agree? Uh, yes and no. Uh, again, if you go back to one of my previous slides, you would see, in, yes, you, you can generate the diagrams. Yes, it can help. You know, I'm not saying it cannot help. Uh, those sort of uh, visualization tools to, to, to represent, you know, all the relationships that you have between the tables with, uh, with uh, the keys and whatnot. Yes, it can help to a limited extent. I'm not saying you should not be using that, but those elements are fine. They can even, you can even, you know, print a few diagrams into your supply chain manual. I think it's relevant. However, um, I would say if, if I have, they, they cannot replace, you know, plain text documentation. Again, remember that most of what you want to document is the why. The, 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 the di table diagram, you know, that gives you the relationship between uh, the tables and, and is it a key that is a foreign key for this other table and whatnot, it only tells you the what. The what is trivial to document. This is not even a problem. So yes, diagrams make it easier probably to document the what, but that was already the easiest part of the, uh, uh, of the challenge. So, so yes, it can help, but keep in mind this is the why that is very, very difficult to document. And this is the, the why that should capture, you know, probably the vast majority of your time and effort and energy. So Alexei Tikhanov, what would be your first uh, best move to start establish those good practices for companies that start at zero? Well, it is just to start writing down the problem statement of the supply chain. It's not supposed to be a very long document. You know, if you don't operate in a company that does something fantastically complicated like aerospace, um, if you do something, if you have a company that does something that conceptually is fairly simple, I would actually start with a very clean problem statement about what um, the, um, the supply chain of this company is about. And that should not be, you know, more than a couple of pages and then have those pages, you know, circulate around so that people have a chance to object, and 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 uh, and, and then by actually answering those objection, uh, objection, you will actually make the document better and stronger, and that will give you a very strong starting point for the rest. Again, um, it's not necessarily something that is very time consuming. The idea is that if you want to start a written tradition, well, it start by just writing the first page. Uh, that just describe the problem in a way that makes sense. And actually, you know, the upper hierarchy might actually find that actually useful to even uh, gain understanding about what their own company is about. Um, so that, that would be, you know, my, my starting point is that start with a very modest document and with the problem statement. Another question from Alexei Tikhanov. If you found a crappy document, let's say a forecasting procedure, how to approach upper management uh, to suggest change or complete rewrite because it is even easier to correct the existing wide politely. Well, I believe that this is a sort of things where it's very touchy. You know, I would not go into attacking the document directly because people are going to take it on their ego. You know, there is this saying that in very good companies, you should be tough on problems and soft on people but it's very difficult and there are very few companies that can achieve that. Usually p companies are <laughs> unfortunately doing the exact opposite. They are tough on people and soft on problems. Um, so, so my suggestion would be to approach upper management with a sort of, of practices. You know, what, uh, what are the sort of rules that qualify for a good document? You know, for example, this inverted pyramid form of writing. And I think that you can emphasize um, that this was already established as, you know, the superior form of writing in the 70s at Procter & Gamble. Uh, um, so so this, those things are not new. This is not cutting edge. It has, it has been, you know, from, from people that really know what they were doing, it has been a very established form of knowledge for a very long time. And so you can get your upper management to a gradual understanding that those are the way to do that. And then they will probably come to their own conclusion when it comes to assess the quality of the material that they might have themselves produced. You see, when I learned 
uh, first, uh, it was uh, a few decades ago from my parents about this inverted uh, form of uh, this inverted pyramid, this, this form of writing, I was shocked because it's, it was pretty much the opposite of what I had been ever been told at school. Uh, so when I, when I suddenly discovered that pretty much everything that I had been taught was basically nonsense and that there was firm, uh, forms of writing that were vastly superior for professional purposes, well, uh, it took me, you know, it took me a bit of time to digest that, but then I started to realize that most of the documents that I'd produced, you know, because I've been carrying very many projects, even when I was in high school, were actually very crappy in, in design. And so, um, and, and so I, I believe that many people can journey through a similar path where if they are exposed to um, the correct ideas, they, do, they will do the, the, the journey themselves and realize that maybe the document that they have produced needs to be improved and maybe they will actually ask other employees for help to do that. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you very much for attending this, uh, to everybody for attending this lecture. I hope that you can, uh, for all of you who do not live in companies that, that are firmly grounded in written tradition, that you can actually start a transition from oral uh, traditions and uh, see you Two weeks from now, it will be same, same day of the week, Wednesday, same time of the day, 3 p.m. time of Paris. Um, see you next time.